Gentlemen, you are both drunk on cosmic wine. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Mark Sylvester. And I'm Dr. Richard Schulman. This, this is, is All Psych. Sound check. Sound check. One, two, one, two, and we are live on tape. Got it. Kick us off. I'm dying to know what the mental wealth tip of the day is. Uh, the mental pen. wealth tip of the day. Get ready. Get ready to write. Everybody get your pens and pencils. Let me get my papyrus. Guess, does anybody still know how to write? I think they're just typing now. Okay, here's the mental wealth tip of the day. It's short, but it's very important. Actually, it is very important. We tend to love the way we wish to be loved rather than the way our partner wishes to be loved. Uh, people think that we only love one way. There was a book came out, The Five Love Languages. I actually think there's at least 12, but that's for another show. So remember, find out how your partner wishes to be loved and you'll do much better in your partnership. Was that Gary, uh, Gary something who wrote Five Love Languages? I don't know, but uh, I know that there's at least 12 and we could do a show on that sometime. I, I, Let's I do it. Let's do it. Add it to the list. Make sure you leave a comment below there, Rich. So there you it, go. it reminds us. But no, That's actually, today's a big day. You know why? Um, it's, I, there's three reasons. I'm going to okay. tell you. Because I'm afraid you're going to guess one of them or two of them. I mean, you won't guess the third one. The first one is... Now, you're not fooling me on this. Right? This isn't an April Fool's joke. Okay, well, actually you, just, are... you just totally cut my April Fool's joke off on the knees. Fuck. So that one's out. I say that There's out loud. There's two things. All right, sorry. <laughs> Second thing is a birthday. We have a birthday to celebrate. It's your birthday. It's your birthday. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. It's tomorrow. And the third thing is a marriage. We are going to marry... Eastern and Western medicine here today on this show. Okay. We're going to marry the left and the right brain today. Well, that's right. And that would be right and left, I guess. Right Right on the corpus callosum. Right. So I'm pretty excited. I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited. I feel like this is a PhD dissertation here today. So I want everyone to get their game chairs, strap in, buckle on. Pop whatever stimulants you do to play uh, your video games uh, for weeks on end and tune in, but don't drop out. Here's the premise. Our brain is a transceiver. This is my stimulant. It's music, you know. The who? Well, it was, yeah. The what? Our brain is like an iPhone in that regard, I guess. Because I guess it... So. It both sends and receives information. I think everyone can agree on that. Like we've got afferent and efferent neurons, things that send impulses to the muscle, receive nerve, like pain signals to the brain. That's not what we're talking about today. So if that's what you thought, tune out. Uh, I'm talking about more like your iPhone in terms of <clears throat> receiving radio waves from towers and transmitting bluetooth to speakers to your car to your personal hotspot, back to the satellites stuff like that and we're going to prove it are you ready are you ready i stay to ready to keep from getting ready that's that's good that's good because i'm really ready but we're going to start on a cellular level all right so so ride with me here we okay. know Modern neuroscience, modern medicine, Western medicine knows cells generate electrochemical energy. Electro that's the way they talk to each other, right? We know about voltage gradients and potassium and sodium pumps and influx and, mm -hmm. and potentials and, and tiny amounts of measurable electricity that moves from cell to cell. Um, so I'm writing, I'm writing all this down, like you said. You know, if you get bigger and bigger, then then you, this you generate a current in a nerve, and they carry these potentials which you can measure, which then on a larger scale, understandably and arguably, and I think most people would agree, create our bioenergetic field, right? So, how far of a leap is it that we have an aura? 
that this field might change based on whatever state we're in, physical, mental, spiritual. Um, matter of fact, a lot of our modern treatments and, and are biologically based, brain stimulation and mental health, whether that's electroconvulsive therapy, you know, where ECT, where they do shock treatments or transcranial magnetic stimulation, where you do magnetic treatments, which then affect the electrical potentials of the brain and turn on neurons through induction. Um, I think it's human nature though. We live in a macroscopic world and we think like macroscopic beings. We don't think about eating protons and neutrons. We wanna eat an apple. We wanna, we wanna see something and touch something. And so it's very easy to ignore and repress all of these actions and all of the machinery of the universe and this invisible level from subatomic all the way up to the much bigger than our scales. We can't really eat a galaxy I and mean, look at them through a telescope, but we really just spend 99.9999% of our time, some of us 100% interacting with the physical world, the world we can perceive with our five sen senses. So, I'm ready to go down the rabbit hole. This is where your mind is going to be blown. Are you ready? Are you ready? You still ready? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm ready. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm waiting, you know, because because what you're implying goes a lot more than just uh, electrical potentials, you know. Yeah, I'm laying, I'm laying sort of the, the mechanical framework because I think everyone's on the boat with me right now. You know, people start bailing out here soon when, well, if they can't keep up here. But so we got that premise. We started sort of that electrocellular level. Um, if you go super, super deep, you know, the, the deepest level of existence of matter, we think it's on a super string scale. So those are what make up the tiniest particles. Now you can get larger and larger and you can get a, a particle like a neutrino that might have been traveling um, for billions of years. And not only can it pass completely through you without bumping into any physical matter, it could go completely through the planet Earth and never bump into anything. Now, those are pretty tiny, tiny particles, but they're, they're measurable. You know, we've built neutrino detectors and every <laughs> once in a while we get lucky and we can measure them. Um, and then if we're thinking about the electrochemical nature and the cellular scale of our bodies, which is the unit of life really, which is why I started there, we know things can irritate it and interfere it, with it, like cosmic rays, things that come from outer space, the ozone layer protects us, airline pilots, people who spend a lot of time at higher altitudes get ex on the space station, they get exposed to a lot higher cosmic ray de density, um, X-rays, uh, those are things, gamma rays, those are things that are called ionizing radiation, which basically means they're of the right size to interfere with our DNA and our cellular processes. This is all known. I think still, is everyone still on the boat? Are we still on the boat? Are you on the boat? Rowing. All right. Yeah. Keep your head down and keep rowing. I don't know where this, we might go off the end of the earth here. But very, very soon I will take us the rest of the way to the end of the earth. All the way home. <clears throat> all the way home. Others okay. interfere <clears throat> on a larger dimension. So you go up to the ultraviolet spectrum. Uh, what do you get? You can get a sunburn from ultraviolet radiation. It's non-ionizing radiation, but it can still damage us, right? But it's on a much higher scale. Microwaves can do right. that. You know, you ever lay on a microwave uh, dish? and let it cook your insides it's a nice way to warm up probably not good for you but um you know how we're, i spent the majority uh, of my childhood so we're all getting cooked right now huh? we're in a sea of electromagnetic radiation that's yes. for sure Absolutely. and some are thought and this is where people are going to start bailing on the boat at least they're not the cool people are going to stick around but radio waves so most modern medicine and science says radio waves can't interfere with us. They're, they're not ionizing. They're not of the right uh, size to even interact with us in a meaningful way. We could do a whole show just on that concept, but it's arguable that radio waves may interact with us, not maybe in the way people tend to think, but obviously in a way that's not nothing. 
So it's, uh, it's potentially a, a health hazard and there's a lot more concern. You see more and more health complaints that people report when they went to 2G and then up to 3G and 5G. And as the electromagnetic soup of the industrial simulation gets thicker and thicker, uh, you know, whales run the ground and birds uh, fall out of the sky and, you know, Project Seafarer and all that good stuff. Well, just because just we can't necessarily perceive it doesn't mean it doesn't affect us. I mean, hit a, blow a dog whistle sometimes, your dog will come running, but you won't hear it. My dog's pretty deaf. That's probably not the best example. Mine'll mine'll come for for yours. Both of them will come for yours. Your dog's way better. Was your no, dog three? No, they're just they're, <laughs> they're just younger. Isn't your dog three years older? We got a three and a one. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you still got good hearing then. My dog's <laughs> deaf as a doornail, or just pretends not to hear me. I'm not sure which. <laughs> but we carry this on not only to a higher scale. But we all know in the 24th century, right? What, what, what do we got starships riding on? I um, teach you up. I, oh, yeah. Starships ride on Solation and Krager waves. Soliton. I think that's, I, Come on, yeah, I think that's, also, that's also a serial, isn't it? Krager waves. It sounds like it should be. It sounds healthy. Sounds like a healthier serial. But there's yeah, hockey, I remember the hockey. Enterprise, they were trying to go faster than warp speed and uh, the, the, the it, 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 Soliton and Krager waves interacted with the matter of the starship in order to carry it faster oh, than, okay. than the uh, than warp speed, Mr. Sulu. So everyone knows that. We just haven't gotten in the 24th century yet to, to verify it. But tell that to Einstein. He knew stuff a century before we could even test it. Yeah, right. so there are some still people on the boat, right? So things get a little weirder when you go back to quantum physics. And I think that's where the land of the left and the right plane and the eastern and the western connect. Because sometimes particles can behave like particles. Other times they can behave like waves. It depends on what they're doing, how you're measuring them. Quantum. Exactly. Yeah. That's homework reading. That's, that's homework reading right there. It's good um, stuff. If you observe a particle, it behaves differently. Heisenberg discover, discovered that. So to me, this is this nebulous land in between the physics and science that's the establishment and is agreed on and a lot of the healing techniques and spiritual um, and maybe even philosophical uh, <clears throat> metrics throughout history. To me, this, this can be what connects them and explains them. So we could do a whole show on that there too. But then I, you, know, you think about other things which are epiphenomena, like a sound wave. What exactly is a sound wave? A sound wave has to have a material to propagate through. Um, can you ride on a sound wave? Yeah, I suppose you could. Sound waves can, are used in warfare now. They, they have acoustic weapons, high energy acoustic weapons, um, targeted acoustic weapons. You can, you know, er earthquakes, a lot of times shock waves are related to sound. Volcanoes create a tremendous amount of sound waves oh, and pressure waves. I can tell you um, when I lived in California, First earthquake I was in, there was a crack before we felt the movement. You, you heard, and then everything started to, to shake. It was amazing. I didn't know that. I guess you had to live it. Yeah, I prefer not to live through an earthquake. But interestingly, volcanoes do that too. They make a really loud crack um, and then an explosion and then usually a boom and a pressure wave and a shock wave. Sometimes they're supersonic, which is a whole different ball of wax. Um, but it's a similar type of interaction between a wave and matter or a particle and how it interacts with matter. Um, I always think of Tesla. We've said it before. We're going to say it again. Uh, this dead white guy told us that if you want to understand the universe, think in terms of frequency and vibration. 
because frequency and vibration, considering sound, do interact with us, especially when we talk about the two piano phenomenon playing the chord that it resonates or the concept of har harmonics. There's a harmonic resonation and that continues beyond our audible range, probably down to the cellular level. Well, um, there, there's no doubt. The it, Japanese it's... researcher has, has <laughs> I forget his name, but has studied it that famously the set effect of sound on, on water crystals, ice crystals, um, not just sound itself, but the tone or the intent. So the energy behind it, kind of like talking to plants, they grow better than if you don't talk to them. Why? What do you think it is? Well, I'm looking up the guy's names. The guy, uh, why is it better? Well, look, I'm going to go the long way around. His name was Emoto, believe it or not, Dr. Emoto. Hmm. Um, kind of an interesting name for a guy who's doing that stuff. My father, <laughs> many years ago, in a, in a display of, of absolute uh, clarity for a science teacher, he said to me once, what's better for you, your mother's soup or Campbell's soup? And, you know, how the, he said, I looked at him dumbfounded. He said, your mother's soup, dummy, because she puts love in it. Mm -hmm. Which is essentially what we're talking about, a vibration that goes into something and affects us. And for sensitive people, for empaths, for, you know, uh, a lot of people that are in the healing arts, your intent seems to matter. And that goes into the quantum physics of things. It seems that the experimenter's intent seems to somehow matter with the results that they get when they get into quantum physics land, the kind of that high energy particle physics where the, the role of the observer seems to create a different outcome depending on where the observer is. This doesn't make sense from a Newtonian world, you know, from a one plus one is two world, but I experience this every day with people in on the healing journey. And I guess that's why we're talking about it because when you start to go more deeply into this and some of the uh, metaphysical experiences that, that I've had, it confirms Tesla again and again and again and again. The, the nature of vibration uh, is, absolutely important and if we go way back to one of my one of my heroes who i happen to have here right here, here right is. Here. uh pythagoras who else has a statue of pythagoras in his office I pythagoras was well i'll get you one if you would like um pythagoras you know he was looking everybody thinks he was looking for geometry you know golden ratios he was looking for spiritual vibrations he was looking to solve the issue of spirit and how vibration harmonizes which i can feel in music all the time uh, you you know music really well too and i think it goes right into this idea that the brain is receiving but it's also giving out um you want to call it electrical, you want to call it energy, I don't I call it whatever you like. But the, the bottom line is, there are some people who you, you will walk into the room and you can feel them right away. Yeah, I think of it yeah. as a potential. Like I always loved your explanation of the two pianos because when the two pianos are both sitting quietly and still, assuming there's no outside influences, no external noise, vibrations through the earth, they're they're completely silent i mean in absence of, of of a force how would you generate energy but the potential is there so that when you do play a chord on the other one it's going to obligatorily respond and that's kind of the thought behind how thoughts affect matter not just the heisenberg and, and particle wave duality and some of these more well it depends how you're looking at it but well, it, and it also depends how, once again, as we usually find out in our discussions, how far down the rabbit hole do we go on this? 
So if I see something that disturbs me, does that mean there's some part of me that's resonating with that? I mean, and so if I see uh, someone who's being cruel to someone, I'll say, well, you're a terrible person. Am I reacting to a cruelty in myself? I mean, it's, you get, when you start going down this, it, it brings up a lot of questions about what does it mean to be human? We always seem to come back, come back to something like that. And if we look at the brain, maybe as a, as a CPU, I don't know, is that how, how we should look at it? But the mind is like the internet. Well, the, and, then, the, and then where's the interface? And, and I have an answer to this. Ah, good, because I don't. <laughs> that I do have an answer to. But the real, but, the real but question- first a word from, first the, a word from our sponsor. <laughs> but that, that, that's, that's the holy grail. And that's what we're you know, about to solve here. And uh, humanity will forever be changed in, in the next 30 minutes. Um, but I'm gonna Pythagoras, have, <laughs> thanks you. First, a word from our sponsor, and I thought that was Oedipus this whole time. Jeez. Um, no, all right, it makes no, no. It makes a lot more sense now. No, no, here's Oedipus. I don't know if you can see him with all the light. It's Siggy. Are you sure that's not Beethoven? No, Beethoven's over here. I have Beethoven. You, yeah. There. Do you have a statue of me in there? Because that would be cool. Um, <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, I do. Wait, what? Yeah, here he is. He's right here. That was you. King Tutankhamun? Can't you see the resemblance? Maybe I have just the lips. Of, I have statues in here. They inspire me. Well, my Jean-Luc Picard inspires me, but I'm usually too lazy to walk across the room and grab him. Well, it was only because we were I wanted to share with it with, with the people about Pythagoras because he's a it's a very powerful uh, influence on me, a very powerful idea as to how I think humanity works. And, and for me, and maybe for humanity, why music is so important. Well, there was, we... music's been around, well, how long do you think music's been around? As long as there have been, for maybe longer than there have been human beings. Oh, you just blew my skull. I was thinking it must've come after fire and the wheel and some of the other stuff or, Maybe so. Uh, well, I mean, there are patterns in nature. You know, whether human beings are there or not, you got a waterfall making patterns on the rocks, making sounds. Oh, okay. Sure. Oh, so we know where you are in that ca camp. If a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, it still makes a noise. <laughs> All right. Um, well, but the thing of it is, just because there's no uh, Homo sapiens around doesn't mean there's no one me? around. Yeah, yeah, no, no, you, you human, uh, human beings oh. uh, around. How do we know there aren't spirits around? How do we know that animals don't respond? Animals respond to rhythm and and. Um, have you have you ever heard the rings of Saturn sing? Actually, yeah. What the hell is that? It's amazing, is what it is. Well, but it, but it, it, once again, it goes back to what is the nature of consciousness? And Pestle, you want to understand the universe things in terms of vibration and frequency. And our brain, if we're looking at the brain as a transceiver, which is the title of this, I, I believe, um, it Copyright. fits perfectly. What'd say? Copyright trademark live long prosper um here's the way i think of tesla okay frequency and vibration if you have a blank piano we know that the second one will resonate and harmonate with it so in one sense one of us could be considered the blank piano and in reality none of us are blank we're kind of playing our our own beats and our own tunes and our periods can get in cycle if we're female which is no one really totally understands the why that the pheromone signaling, maybe, maybe there's a lot of more bioenergetics involved, but we have a certain frequency. And if we witness someone else doing a kind act to a third party, it raises our vibration. It decreases depression. We know this, this is measured. So similarly, like you said, if they say something 
negative, hurtful, you see some trauma or abuse, that will affect the us as a as a obligatory piano, even a sociopath on some level. The sociopath may have thicker strings to vibrate, but no one's immune from the nature of our existence. And if we were talking about EEGs and EMGs, you know, a hundred years ago, everyone would think this is science fiction. So is it really science fiction right now to extrapolate the bioenergetics? To, to, to realize we don't have a tool to measure meridians yet, but we probably will before too long. We don't have a tool yet to measure auras, but some people actually are already are. It's, but there will become a point where we measure these things and it will be just as boring as an EEG or an EMG, or, you know, I'm always amazed with MRI. That's, there's a lot of quantum um, spin that, that happens when you align, stand up protons and a really powerful magnetic field, and then you turn it off, and as they decay, they emit a little uh, radio wave that a collector measures. Yeah, that sounds like some Star Trek crap in real time. So let, what's our famous quote from, uh, who is it, L. Ron Hubbard? No. Arthur C. Clarke. Thank you. I get them confused. What's our famous quote from Arthur C. Clarke? That's very any, much- Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So this isn't magic to me. This is just like Einstein saying, nope, this is the nature of the universe. When you, uh, when you humans get the technology uh, to verify what I'm saying, that'll be good for you, but God doesn't play dice. I already know I'm right. Kind would, of thing. Would, you, would you say, I mean, we're talking about the brain as a transceiver, but as you know, I'm a fan of... Um... <laughs> I was about to say I'm a fan of astrology when I'm a fan of oriental medicine, I'm a fan of acupuncture. Um, is the body a transceiver as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because every place there's a cell, there's an electrochemical gradient, there's a voltage potential, there's an action potential, which is essentially a current. And these are quantifiable and measurable. I mean, I the moment that I realized that in life was when you did the galvanic uh, test on a frog leg in like fifth grade biology or whatever. That blew my mind because it's like, whoa, we're electrochemical beings. I see it now. I get it. And now it's something we take for granted, but we forget how important that is and what that means, both in our brain, in our mind, anywhere in our body. But what about outside our body? If we're emitting electrochemical field, let's call it an aura, and I have another field that's interacting with it, whether it's ionizing radiation, non-ionizing radio waves, uh, another piano, I mean, another human in this case, it's going to affect that field from the out all the way down to a subcellular level. And that's why thoughts are so important, what we tell ourselves, right? Negative self-talk versus positive self-talk. Oh, and it works. There's another thing that maybe is connected to this is the idea of torsion fields. That uh -huh. let's say somebody comes in my office and they're really angry, that that anger will kind of hang out there for a while until it's cleared. That's why I have, uh, I used to burn sage to clear, but everybody thought I was getting high. So now I have a a handy dandy little spray that clears the room. Um, I actually think it, it's true, you know, that I've experienced that when people grow up in angry families, let's say, they absorb that energy. It, it affects them, even if nobody's yelling at a particular moment, people can feel it. I think that's exactly what we're feeling during the last two years. And that how it's so, like you said, palpable, like a stinky fart hanging in the air of an elevator where the um, person who dealt it is long gone and you become the person who smelt it. Um, we've all had that unfortunate experience. Yes, I mean, it being the, the dealer, not the smeller. That so energy it, hangs out. And how does that connect to, to maybe spiritual energy like ghosts or something like that? We've had we've talked about ghosts and goblins and goonies and oh my and all kinds of stuff on the show before. But how does the bioenergetic imprint of a previous event 
or maybe a previous entity, whether that is in our plane of existence or maybe some afterlife, bardo plane, spiritual plane, uh, interdimensional beings that kind of break through, they have to leave a wake in this electromagnetic soup. Well, and I mean, I've had many um, experiences with uh, loved ones who had passed over to the other side. And you, you know, you could say if you wanted to that I made it up because I wanted to see them. But it was so uncanny. Wasn't thinking about it when it happened. I wasn't saying, oh, mom, where the heck are you? And people report this just before death. We've had shows on that too. Um, I'm actually thinking about something else right now that we didn't talk about before, before the show. You know, there's all kinds of theories that there are devices that can project voices into your head. This would argue that that's, people say, oh, that's just conspiracy theory stuff. This idea would argue that that is more than uh, possible. Absolutely. Matter of fact, it, it would be impossible not to be able to do that. Um, you know, do we have the technology to do that? Maybe. Will we? Most certainly. Because just as the brain generates the signal to have a voice in your head, whether that's your own thoughts, your own inner monologue, your own internal critic, your own consciousness, or a memory of someone else's voice, or hearing someone's voice that we're uh, we're translating acoustic sound energy, right, into the exact same electrochemical energy that, that our brain interprets as, as the voice through the auditory cortex. It's basically electric potential, potentials. It's not, a, on one hand, it's not a measurable objective reality, but it's a reality of perception of that particular piano, that particular organism in the state that they're in when they receive it. So let's, let's get even scarier. Not that that isn't scary enough. So it, so that lends it to the idea that if the brain is projecting, that somebody with a one of these with the right program, hello, could uh, know what we're thinking. Which brings the thought police, 1984. I'd like to make 1984 fiction again. Um, <clears throat> Let's send the, it back I, to 1984. What's that? Let's send it back to 1984. I would love to. I mean, you know, you're talking about this thing. We've said we've said before, this is really interesting that this thing that every single person that you know has in their pocket could have easily powered the entire Apollo mission to the moon from the onboard computers to uh, all ground control and telemetry. And that really should blow everyone's mind. So if technology and science, the electrical science, we'll call it, is moving at that uh, exponential rate, then the basic understanding of, of how the brain works and the, and the neuroscience and the cell biology, it's just a matter of time before, like you said, you have a device in your pocket and it's an app like, oh, hey, give this guy uh, this thought. That, that there is certainly a, a, a arguable argue uh, mechanism for that that uh, what is the, na the name silly. of that um, there was a, a minority report where they had the pre-crime division if somebody was mm -hmm. thinking of something they would arrest them was that minority report or was that the one with uh, Ethan Hawke and uh, some blonde chick no that that was a, the yeah, that was Galactica minority okay, okay. report was when the, the psychics would come up with Oh, that's um, right. You know the 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 pre crime and Tom Cruise yeah. would. Uh, that was a good. You know, yeah, that was a good movie. Yeah, I I read that actually it was a short story by Philip K. Dick that they made into a movie and the short story was much better. What a shock! The, than the actual movie, it was, the short story was fabulous. It left a lot more um, unanswered questions, which I, is part of what we're talking about here, because the mis these things. We're trying to understand mysteries. Let and I know that, um, that, you know, so we're, we're able to tune into things. Psychics can tune into things. You can know who's 
calling on the phone, you know, before they call, and not just because their name lights up. Um, you can be thinking about someone and they call. I know that with people that I'm close to, I can feel when they're hurting, when they haven't told me. And I don't mean by seeing them. I mean, I'll, I'll call somebody up and say, what's going on with you today? Yeah, how did you know? I don't know. It just I had a weird feeling about it. So we have lots be. of we have lots of anecdotal data on this. And that could be explained uh, or interpreted several ways, like on a, on a cellular level that that um, some sort of a signal is communicating between the two people, the two pianos in local space. So in the world as we live and, and understand it, like measuring atomic uh, particles and, and frequencies and vibrations and radiations and all of that. Or it could be on a deeper level, a non-matter level, an ethereal level, whether the, you know, an astral body uh, hypothetically doesn't have any matter. It exists only as pure energy. And maybe even it exists out of time. Maybe time, you know, one of the things Einstein was working on was time only exists if similar to gravity, if matter can can create a potential, a gravity well can dent into the fabric of space time. Mm -hmm that they're all intimately linked. So if you don't have matter, you really don't require time. And then you have a tesseract of existence, an infinite number of potentials. But how do you get from that world to this world? And well, you're ready, you ready to reveal the answer to I think I'm ready question to question about, about the linkage? Are we, is it okay if we change humanity? Okay, let's change humanity. Three. Are you ready? You ready two, to go this one? Do so it. if you look at the way the brain prioritizes information in terms of the hierarchy of, of software, let's say, or, or even hardware for that matter. And you compare it to a computer, right? When you first turn on a computer, there's a BIOS. It's programmed into the actual hardware. It's some of the deepest level programming. And then, you know, it might load DOS or whatever. And then it might load an operating system. And then it might load a program. And then it might load an app. And then that app might load another so, you know, music song or something, there are layers on there. And there's two ways we can interpret it, physiologically and embryologically. So physiologically, we know, hey, if a car pulls out in front of me, my frontal lobe is the first thing to go quiet. It'll go, it'll, it'll go back more towards reptilian brain. And embryologically, if you look how the brain forms, it, you know, there's three major parts, the prosencephalon, the mesencephalon, and the telencephalon. But the order that they develop should be the reversed order of wherever the, the energy that gives the breath of life comes from. And one of the earliest, earliest structures is the pineal gland. And it happens to be a midline structure, which is important because the left brain and the right brain do work very differently. And the corpus callosum does connect them, but it really doesn't communicate all that well. Oops, that's is that, are you getting married? Is that, is that a... No, 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 I'm just trying to activate my pineal gland with a guitar pick. So spiritualists will tell you that, you know, the first chakra um, is where you download from a higher plane through the pineal gland, the breath of life. So when you have a thought, where does it come from? Does it actually, is it actually generated from from the gray matter and the, and the cells, and then within the cells, you keep looking, I never find the thought. What is an original thought? We don't know whether it's, you know, whether it's something from the physical world or whether that thought or that download or that impression that a mother gets if their child's been in the accident or you can sense if somebody's mood is off, if that comes from beyond the pineal gland. And here's where I'm going to blow your skirt up because this is crazy cool stuff. And I'd like to pretend like I invented it and discovered it. Um, let's just go ahead and let me take credit for it. Please do. But there's a really interesting thing. If you look at pineal tissue, um, well, you were talking about near-death experiences and kind of the end of life. And one thing we know is there's a hormone, a chemical, a tryptamine that that's floods the, the bloodstream um, really at the moment of death. And where does it come from? The pineal gland. 
Mm -hmm. What is the evolutionary advantage of giving a human a near-death experience? They're dying. There is no evolutionary advantage. It makes no sense whatsoever. Why do you care if this being has a, has a humane death? Why do you care if they have a vision or a life review? There's absolutely, Charles Darwin would say this is hooey. There's no reason that it should exist, yet it does. Most people now agree and understand near-death experiences, dimethyltryptamine being released from the pineal gland. Well, why it does it could be explained by the connection to this outer world, another world, maybe an infinite number of world, maybe an infinite number of planes of existence, or maybe one single tesseract of infinite potential, infinite consciousness, infinite time. And, and I don't know if people can see this, but this has been known for a long time. There's the eye of Ra, and it looks just like the pineal gland. Go figure. Of course, the Egyptians also pulled your, your brain through your nose because they thought the seat of the soul was in the heart. But they probably argued and debated this amongst themselves too. <laughs> Good one. They did. That was the first thing they did was drain your skull of this liquid goo. What's, what's that for? That's not helpful. Well, it's a pretty amazing, pretty amazing thing that. Uh, What's know, amazing that they... is if you look at pineal tissue and it's a tiny little, about the size of a pea. It's very tiny. It's tinier than the pituitary. It's tiny. It is the hypothalamus. It's, it's one of the tiniest brain structures. The, the back of the brain stem has these mammillary bodies. It's even tinier than that. It's really tiny, yet it's extremely important and powerful. We think it has to do with circadian rhythms. It does so much more than that because melatonin is involved. Melatonin, interestingly, is a tuning fork for the piezoelectric properties of the pineal gland. What the hell does that mean? It means if you look at this okay. tissue under a scanning electron microscope, there are what they call second harmonic generation measurements of, of actual uh, potential, piezoelectric potential. And this is ancient science too, in the fifties, you know, every, every, every radio, every RC car, they all use piezoelectric uh, transmitters. So we know a lot about the science to find those structures in the pineal gland in the force and the form of biologic piezoelectric crystals, materials or crystals um, is kind of, uh, the bridge to me between what we know about the brain and what we know about beyond. It's what, it's the actual um, Rosetta Stone. It's the connector. It's the adapter, if you will, between two worlds, because these mulberry-like, and, and I, they call them mulberry. To me, they look like blackberry, raspberries, or even a snowflake. They're very complex crystals. Um, and, and you can see them under scanning electron microscope scope. They're, they're faceted um, and they vibrate through the breath of existence through, you know, it's, it's, it's if the, the puppet master strings all flow through there and you can damage your pineal gland. We all damage our pineal glands. And it's been generally understood that damage to the pineal gland will damage a lot of people's sense of uh, connection to their spirituality, to the universe, maybe lose psychic abilities, properties like that. Um, fluoride. Fl fluoride is the most notorious. Um, but even as much as I hate to admit it, even Prozac has argued to uh, calcify the pineal gland. Um, well, that makes it, perfect sense. It, but it contains fluoride as well. So fluoride kind of acts as a, um, a cage of these crystals, and it doesn't allow them to, to vibrate and transceive and is in an effective way. And the longer we live, the more calcified our pineal. It kind of helps explain in life, just to me, to some degree, why children tend to be the most psychic. Children are more likely to see ghosts, um, animals that don't live as long, you know. Um, 80 year olds don't always have the most uh, adept connection to, to their source. Now, when you get closer to death, that might change. But if you've got damage to the pineal gland, and I've seen it, you know, we had a, a lot of cadavers in, in medical school 
And it was very interesting how some people's pineal glands look, look beautiful and other people's looked like the outside skin, a hard shell of like a garbanzo bean. And we never really think much of it. Modern medicine's like, well, yeah, that's just something that happens with age. Well, is that normal? Maybe. It doesn't sound Maybe like it's common. Way. Well, but if we look at um, the rates of addiction and mental health problems and just our inability to get along, you know, we, uh, we want uh, the Ukrainians and the Russians to make a peace treaty and our divorce rate is over 50%, you know, so these are people who are supposed to love each other. How the hell are we going to get, um, you know, warring countries to stop fighting? That's the way. You know, when, when you have that universal love, you're not wanting to beat anybody up. I think it's hard if you're, you know, operating at a frequency of love or intention or gratitude. They're very far away from anger, retaliation, vengeance, resentment, that, is, that you, they can't coexist. Right. You can't be in fifth gear and be in first gear at the same time. And you got to pass through third. Well, you know, isn't it, isn't it uh, amazing that in so many of our discussions, we come back to love being the answer. Somebody said that about 2000 years ago, I think, and other people have said it since. But it is so fascinating to me that so many times when we go into non-ordinary mind kind of discussions, we come back to love, the vibration of love being a healing event for the species and for each other, but certainly for the entire species. And um, we're at a very precarious time right now where those loving vibrations are under attack. They're, they're beyond under attack. Um, you know, just like it's hard for, uh, it takes some energy for the silent piano to pick up the frequency of this one. If this piano is already playing at a lower frequency or at a frequency out of phase or a frequency that would attenu attenuate the energy of this one, it's gonna take longer to bring it back up in sync, kind of that hemi-sync type of uh, show that we did. So love and fear don't usually go well together. And we've been living under tremendous amount of fear and stress. And I think that's really attenuated, lowered a lot of people's energy. And therefore it affects all of us, even, even uh, Tom, what's his face on the deserted island? Tom oh yeah, Hanks. Wilson. Yeah, even Wilson, Wilson was the ball. Even the volleyball is feeling the stress in the, of, this, of in the zeitgeist. And for people who might be empaths, and I think mo there are many people who don't know they're empaths and are empaths. I know that when the, when the pandemic began, I was driving up Fruitville Road and I had a panic attack. Couldn't figure out what happened. Pulled the car over and I went, wait a minute, I'm feeling the entire community's fear of the, of the coronavirus. And then it, it left. <laughs> your brain is just a better transceiver than mine i'm not sure I, I sometimes it's a bit of a bug you know to have to experience these things and one of the one of the things we we do have to learn is how to shield ourselves you know and and you're not going to shield yourself if you don't know you're picking up the the uh signals so how do you shield yourself let's say that people want to love they want to get back there. They want, they want to um, be self-aware and, and then they want to shield themselves. H how do they do that? You take a spoon and you get it to... You realize there's you, no you do, spoon? I like you do it. it the old fashioned way. You meditate, you pray, you do yoga, you do dancing, you do chanting, you enhance your vibration you you work on the things that bother you you know the, um, so all of those things the old the old sufis you know had a thing called the 99 names of god i just love this concept the imam knew 
where you were missing in your energy field, he would have you chant the name of God to fill that energy field up. When you're filled with, with love, it's, it is harder. It's not impossible, but it's harder to shake you off your, off your uh, balance. You know, but like our pianos, right? If you're up here with love, then it's harder for the lower energy to drag you down. It's not impossible. I mean, Ram Das tells a story. He said, do you love me unconditionally? And the guy says, well, of course I do. He says, well, I'm going to punch you in the nose. How do you feel now? He goes, it's a little harder now. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing all of those have in common is raising your vibration, raising your the frequency, uh, operating at frequencies of love and um altruism and some of the things that really resonate at a much higher level so the shield is really about attenuating centering focusing and raising that's what makes most sense to me um and the idea that there is higher intelligence you know and connecting with it i mean look we don't have um scientific experiments proving this exactly but we have thousands of years of anecdotal experiences of people connecting with, call it God, if you if you like, you know, the the maker, whatever you want to call it, that gives people that sense of oneness, universe, maybe. Um, it's it, some of this stuff, you know. Einstein said God does not play dice with the universe. And there was a writer named Karl Hammerschlag who, who said, well, not only does God play dice with the universe, sometimes he hides the dice where you can't find it. The, the idea though, is that there are ways that we can raise our vibration, um, but we have to get out of this idea that the guy who dies with the most toys wins and and that material is everything look i studied with a, a buddhist scholar for for two years great guy and uh, he said you know we don't everybody thinks buddhists don't want you to have a, a nice car or a fancy house he goes in have one enjoy it but just don't be attached to it yeah so yeah. The, the the attachment in that material in the material world, I think George Harrison had something to say about living in the material world. Uh, it wasn't that sting. Or police. Oh, um, well, they both did, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sting had one. George Harrison had an album called Living in the Material World. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They all do. The, the bottom line. They get line, it. They're though, all musicians. Yes. And I would say this as... Uh, when I'm playing with my band and we are in sync with each other, it it feels magical. I come back, I can have the worst day and I go and play, I come back, I feel fantastic. It's it's amazing. And if we had EEGs on all of you, we would probably see a convergence and bring well, we would patterns. given given my band, we'd probably crash the machine. <laughs> well, now that we solved the secrets of existence in the universe and how uh, this world uh, connects to the next. Pythagoras, uh, thanks you. I'm gonna drop a mic. Uh, can I drop this thing? No. I think you can. I think uh, this was a fabulous idea. This is all the time we have for day. Uh, next time we're gonna probably tackle something a lot easier, like ending the conflict and, 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 and maybe uh, world hunger, or something, something really just kind of easy. We don't need to put a lot of effort into. All we gotta do is, Make believe that world hunger is a disease big pharma can make money off and solved. That sounds like a 24th century utopian vision I could buy into. Okay. Until let's next buy, week. Let's buy into it. I just bought it. I clicked buy it now. Until next week. Be well. That was good. Might be our best one yet. Good one. <laughs>